Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us here at Cornerstone at our online worship service. And if you're new or just checking us out, we especially want to welcome you. And please uh, go to our website to find more information. That's cornerstonesomerset.org. And you can even contact us through our website. And you can uh, send us uh, any questions that you may have, and we'd be glad to um, answer them and to have a conversation with you about what our church is doing and what we uh, are called to do here in Somerset, New Jersey. And so to begin our time of worship, and we're going to ask the Lord to bless us. We're going to pray to him and ask him to um, show his grace and his spirit upon us here this morning. Um, but before we do that, I just wanted to say we hope that you, you enjoy this time of worship with us and that you can experience a glimpse of God's grace and love for you as we give glory to him because of what Christ has done for us on the cross. And so please bow your heads with me and let's pray together. Blessed are those whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his testimonies, who seek him with their whole heart, who also do no wrong, but walk in his ways. Lord, help us to walk in the ways of you because life is better when we are in you. You give us true hope, love, and joy. So may we experience this here today and may we see how amazing it is to walk in your ways and in your laws bless us as we worship you and may we see your grace and love here in our midst and in Jesus' name we pray amen let's praise the lord together welcome again cornerstone we're glad you can join us this morning uh, let's join our hearts and our voices together and give God the praise that he deserves. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from. The king of my heart Be the shadow where I hide The ransom for my life Oh, he is my song Cause you are good, you're good Let me 
gonna let, you're never gonna let me down Cause you are good, you're good Oh, cause you are good, you're good Oh, cause you are good, you're good Oh, cause you are good
never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. You never stop, never stop working. You never stop, never stop working. Even when I don't see that you're working. Even when I don't feel that you're working. Stop working, even when I can see you you're working, even when I can feel you you're working. You never stop, never stop working, you never stop, never stop working. Whoa. Hello again, Cornerstone. Uh, at this time, we're going to corporately pray together and ask the Lord to help our church and help our world. So please, again, let's uh, pray together. Dear God, first, we thank you, Lord, for your continued grace upon us. Even in the midst of a pandemic, you sustain us, you protect us, and you remind us of how much we need you. So we pray that Cornerstone can continue to trust in you during these difficult times. There are those in our church community and in the communities around us that are still looking for work. So Lord, we pray for our economy to be strengthened over time and for opportunities to arise even, even in these chaotic times. So Lord, we pray that you continue to help us to fellowship, to worship you, to serve you, and to love our neighbors and our communities. Lord, we also pray for you to help our world. Lord, we pray for our country, that we may uh, make progress uh, with racial injustice and that our hearts and minds would all change in how we view one another, Lord, and that we would love one another unconditionally as you have loved us. And Lord, we pray for you to help those out in the West Coast dealing with the, the fires and the danger that everyone is in out there. Lord, we also pray for our southern region of our country where those in Alabama and Florida have been hit with the hurricane again. Lord, we pray for uh, protection for those people, Lord, and pray for you to guide them as many of them have to start over in their lives. So, Lord, uh, help these people in our country who are suffering, who are struggling during this time, and may they turn to you, O Lord. And God, we pray for our missionaries around the world who continue to do your kingdom work in the midst of a pandemic. We especially pray for Vivian, who serves in the UK, but is now in New Jersey for a time to visit her family. We pray for this time here to be a refreshing time and rest, a restful time as well during these next few weeks. And we also pray for our brother Nathan, who serves at Rutgers with crew who have started their fall semester. We pray for him and their ministry to be able to connect with students even though it is virtual this upcoming semester. So give them wisdom and how they can continue on in their ministries. And again, we give thanks to you, Lord, because even in the midst of all that is going on in our world, we know that you are good, that you are faithful, and that you promise to provide, protect, and sustain us. Lord, we lean on you and trust in you, O oh Lord, because, Lord, that is all we can do. And we do all of this because... Lord, we know we have victory in Christ, and it is in his name we pray. Amen. Hi, my name is Annie, and I'll be reading a scripture passage for this week, which comes from 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 17 in ESV. Feel free to follow along in your own Bibles or with the passage on the screen. Once again, 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 to 17. 
And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. I am writing to you, little children, because your sins are forgiven for his namesake. I am writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I am writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. I write to you, children, because you know the Father. I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. The word of the Lord. Good morning, Cornerstone. It's great to be with you once again. We continue with this second message in our series called Walking Like Jesus, which is focusing on the letters of John in the New Testament, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And we are now in 1st John. You know, each of us have a unique way of walking. I didn't know if you've ever realized that. Um, you can really observe this in places that are uh, like large public places, though now it would be quite different with COVID. But uh, if you've ever sat in a park, you can watch people walk by and notice each of them have a unique walk or Port Authority or Penn Station or Liberty International Airport. Um, if you sit there and just watch people, you can see that each person has a unique walk and the way they walk. Some people take long strides and they're like in a hurry. Other people like shuffle along. Um, they're just taking their time or they take small steps. Uh, some people look uh, ahead and they're focused on where they're going. Others just keep their eyes down to the ground and like are looking at their feet. Um, I've always was amused at President Bush and how he walked. He like upright, uh, back straight and with his arms swinging like in rhythm. Uh, very stiff like walk and then in contrast to President Obama as you can see uh, he's more relaxed and uh, kind of flowing in his walk uh, and then of course President Trump has his own walk too if it, interesting that those who model clothing are trained on how to walk a certain way um, and I don't know why they are it's in a sense they all have to walk a certain way to model the clothing. And the fact is that we all have our own way of walking. And when I'm not wearing my glasses, uh, and I can't see clearly at a far distance. And so, but I, when I see one of you like way out in the parking lot, and I'm not sure who you are, but if I can see you walk a little bit, I can usually tell who it is because I can recognize your walk. Well, the Apostle John, uh, one of the disciples of Jesus that was chosen, one of those 12 disciples, who also is commonly believed to be the author of these New Testament letters, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, he, in our text today, uses walking to mean living. It's the idiom there in that time period. Walking refers to how people conduct their lives and express their attitudes in their actions. 
And this makes sense in John's day because people would walk everywhere. They wouldn't be able to take the bus or the train or get in their car and drive or even many people or most people didn't even ride a horse or a donkey. Uh, only some few would do that. Everyone just walked everywhere and walking took up a lot of time of their day because they had to walk to get to wherever they were going. And so naturally they probably were on much better shape than we are because today what is the thing that takes up most of our time of the day or we find experiencing most of the day is sitting, right? We sit in front of our computer, we sit in our cars to drive somewhere, we sit in the train or bus to go somewhere. We're sitting all the time. Um, but in those days, people were walking or standing all the time. And so walking was a big part of the common person's daily life. And in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6, in our text last week, uh, to walk and to live were connected. Listen again to that verse. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. And then the NIV brings this connection out more obviously in the English, saying, If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. Uh, practice the truth, live out the truth. It's how we live life. And the letter 1 John was written because there were schisms, uh, divisions that were coming from within the churches of that um, time. And there were people who were from the churches and had left the churches. Some were still in the churches, but they were teaching false teachings and still claiming to be followers of Christ Jesus. And this is why the phrase we will hear so often in especially these first two chapters of, of this letter, 1 John, like we say or whoever says, uh, appears so often. And so let, let's look at a couple examples of those. In chapter 1, verse 8, it says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Chapter 1, verse 10, If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 6, in our text now, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. This is the verse we get our title for the series, Walk Like Jesus. And then chapter 2, verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. See, if we say whoever says, it's kind of like this term of if we claim, that kind of thing. And the Apostle John wrote to help believers at that time in the churches there to discern who the true followers of Christ were and who were not. Because he wanted them to identify who was teaching falsely and that they were not really brothers or sisters in Christ. But at the same time, by doing this, John provided a way of assurance to those who were following Christ because of the evidence that we can see of those who truly follow Christ, in obedience especially. Do you claim to be a Christian, a follower of Jesus? How is your walk? How are you sure that you know and follow the Lord Jesus? Well, the Apostle John answers this question in verse 3, the first verse of our text this week, saying, And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Jesus himself said in the Gospel of John, in chapter 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will obey what I command. We know that we have come to know him by our loving obedience. So, for example, we teach our children, hopefully, <laughs> that if they are walking along and a stranger, someone they don't know, pulls up in a vehicle and says to them, hey, hop in, I'll give you a ride, that we teach them to run the other direction and not look back. We teach them that when a stranger who has no trusting relationship with them uh, comes and says something like that, they have permission to disobey that command or that order that was given to them. Don't obey them, we tell them. But if someone they know, uh, someone who knows maybe the secret word that we use with them, uh, 
in anticipation of something like this to happen, if they know the secret word and they're familiar at least with this person, that they can trust them because of the trusting relationship they have with uh, us, their parents. And when we are in relationship with God, similarly, and have this trusting relationship with the Lord God as our God the Father, then we then can trust and obey what He tells us because we know it is for our good and out of His love. Verse 4 says, Whoever says, I know Him, but does not keep His commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. John here is referring to uh, an intellectual knowledge. Unfortunately, at times, we promote this in the church. And we do this by stressing Bible study as super important, which it is super important, um, and knowing God's Word. Um, but we don't then stress that not only knowing God's Word and learning God's Word, what it says, but to obey God's Word. We kind of brush over that. We say you should, but we don't stress that. And then we are just, in a sense, raising up this intellectual knowledge as the ultimate importance. Like as kids, right, we teach our kids to memorize the Bible and be able to spit it out. Um, but if we don't teach them to obey what they're memorizing, then it's just this intellectual knowledge. Um, and so we stress obedience with small children, but with adults, we hesitate to do that. Uh, I mean, this would mean me uh, meddling in each other's lives, but in the context of a loving, trusting relationship with each other, as well as we all follow the Lord Christ. You know, I find it very helpful and valuable when someone comes to me in the context of a trusting and loving relationship with me, that they then share with me that what I did was wrong and was hurtful or caused misunderstanding with others. And so I will listen and take that and then be more careful in the way I treat others in the future because it was not honoring to the Lord Christ. But if it's no trusting and loving relationship, then I may not listen to them. I may not even take it seriously. This is all about the attitude of the heart, which is what God is all concerned with. John, the apostle here, who wrote this letter, 1 John, isn't writing about a one-time disobedience to the commands of God, but an attitude of disobedience, an inclination of the heart toward disobedience, a lifestyle of disobedience. If a man claims to know Jesus and doesn't desire to obey God's commands, doesn't desire, to, in a sense, to direct his life or her life in the direction of following Christ and his teachings, then they are not following Christ and his teachings. Uh, and they are a liar if they claim that they have fellowship with the Lord God. He, this person may know about Jesus, but does not know Jesus personally as Lord. Now, this similarly applies to our families and our relationships within our families, especially between children and parents. Think about it. The more we know our parents personally in depth, the more we have this attitude that we can respect and listen to them. I mean, how well do we really know our parents? I mean, sure, we know what triggers their anger, uh, what mood swings they may have, um, what makes them happy, what their patterns are, what their likes and dislikes are, but do we know their fears and struggles of their emotions in the sense of why, what's causing those things? Did they struggle in school? When they went to school, did they, what kind of grades did they get? And I wouldn't suggest bringing this up when they're getting on us about our grades. But in another time, ask them about their grades. Did they struggle? Were they close to their parents when they were growing up? What kind of tragedies or abuse did they experience before we came along? Do we know about that? All this of knowing who our parents are and what has made them who they are, their experiences in life, 
the tragedies, the abuse maybe they've experienced will give us a deeper understanding of why they are the way they are. And it will give us a deeper respect than to listen to their advice, to obey them as children when we're children, but as adults then to seriously take their advice into mind before we make a decision. The more we know and understand our parents, the more we will desire to know what they would think about something and to listen to them. Even more so in the way we approach the Lord God, Jesus Christ, our Savior. The more we know Him, the more we will love Him. And the more we then love Him, the more we desire to obey and follow His lead in our life. Verses 5 and 6 of chapter 2 continue saying, But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Loving obedience works in two ways. One, it is through obedience that we come to know and experience the Lord God, the Lord Christ Jesus. Interesting that the more we obey, the more we come to know and experience the Lord God. And then the second uh, way of obedience works in that obedience then also is confirmation of the, and is evidence that we are actually following the Lord God, the Lord Christ. How is your walk? Are you walking like Jesus? And this doesn't mean choosing disciples like he did or <laughs> performing many miracles like he did, or even going to the cross and being crucified like he did. Um, but it, walking like Jesus means following his example of complete obedience to the Lord God and loving service to other people. This is the example we follow. John goes on in, verses, in chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, saying, Beloved, I am writing you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At the same time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. The old and new command that John writes about here is love one another. Now this command was, in a sense, old because it was already known by the Jews of that time period in the time of John. From the Old Testament, Leviticus chapter 19, verse 18 says, Love your neighbor as yourself, which is the second and greatest commandment that Jesus uh, gave uh, in his teachings. The first being, love God with all your heart, soul, and mind, and strength. And then it, this old command to love one another gave, uh, has this new quality when Jesus in the Gospel of John Chapter 13, verse 34 says, A new command I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. And this new quality to this command is when Jesus says, As I have loved you, so you must love one another. You see, Jesus demonstrated how we are to love one another. He lived it out in front of his disciples. And how he treated the poor and the sick and the lepers how he treated the Pharisees and the leaders. It was all out of the love that God has for each and every individual. And especially on the night before he was, or the night he was betrayed, he washed the disciples' feet. He showed them how to be a servant, even though they are at the same time leading people toward him. He, he was that example, and ultimately how he gave his life for their behalf. So we are to give our lives up to point others to Jesus. You know, the kind of love that the disciples experienced from Christ, Jesus, is unlike anything they've had ever, have ever experienced before. It was an amazing love. So we can see that love, this, added, this heart love from God, is to be a unifying force and an identifying mark of the Christian community, of the church of Jesus Christ. And so that's why verses 9 through 11 then highlight this absolute contrast between light and dark, or love and hate. Listen to what it says. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother 
is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. What happens if we really dislike a fellow brother or sister in Christ? Does this mean that we're not really a believer or follower of Jesus? Well, these verses here are not talking about disliking a disagreeable Christian brother or sister. There will always be people that we don't get along with well, that we may dislike, and especially within the family of God. John's words here focus on this attitude of hate that causes us to ignore or despise others and to treat them as enemies or inferior or, or something like that. You see, love is a choice. It's not a feeling that we fall into. We choose to love. And we can choose to be concerned with people's well-being and pray for them, even though we may dislike them and not have great affection for them personally. And as we decide to act in a loving way, in honor of the Lord Jesus and what he has called us to do, God will help us express his love to these people that we may dislike. Yeah, it's, it's the love of God. It's a choice we make to follow Christ and to walk like Jesus walked. Love is the Christian's identifying mark, and it is a love for God and a love for others that he enables us to do. But it's definitely not a love of the world as we see in verse 15. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The world, or this word world here in the, the text, is not used here to mean the people of the world or the natural physical aspects of this world, but it, it is referring to this world system. The system which is in the realm of Satan's influence. The corrupt system which opposes God and his followers. So therefore, love for the world and love for God are mutually exclusive. The two loves do not mix. They can't mix. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, No one can serve two masters. Either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. We cannot serve and love God while we love something in the world. We cannot. They, just, they don't mix together. They can't exist together. James chapter 4, verse 4 also speaks to this, saying, You adulterous people. Don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred toward God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. The love of the world and our love for God, they just don't go together. We may think they do, but then we are making ourselves out to be a liar if we love something in the world and we say we still love God. Uh, it's like what First John is saying. We are a liar if this is the inclination of our heart. Verse 16 in our text goes on to describe what things are of the world. It says, For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, it uh, is not from the Father, but is from the world. So the world has these three characteristics here. First, the desires of the flesh. And this refers to the way we take a good, natural desire and we take it to the extreme. We uh, refers to an, like an, an excessive affection or desire. It is a desire without boundaries. There's no boundaries. It's just We just take it as far as we can go with it. It is a craving that drives us to excess. And this refers to how we allow our desire for possessions, for money, uh, for food, for success, for acceptance of others, uh, for entertainment, for sex, or any other thing of this world to control us. And these things 
then become our focus in life. In a sense, we are no longer following Jesus. We are following these things. They become our idol. We become experts for whatever pleasure it is or thing we're pursuing, and we live for it or them. We pursue them without staying within the limits that God has ordained for us in his word. And whatever it is becomes this idol that we follow after and worship because we give it much greater worth than following the Lord God himself. For example, our children are God's gifts to us. And we are called to love and protect and to guide our children in the ways of the Lord Christ. But when we put our children and their future Um, as more important than following the Lord Christ, then they will become an idol themselves. uh, We can make our children our idol that we pursue. Uh, So, for example, if we schedule them to be involved in things that will help their future um, and that consistently remove them from participating in the community of the church or the Christian instruction or fellowship, Uh, then we are basically teaching our children that following Jesus is not as important as preparing for their future. Uh, And so either the pursuit of education or their pursuit of personal achievements is more important. It almost becomes their idol. Uh, And it is then uh, leads them in a way in the other direction than following the Lord Jesus. And we are teaching them this by structuring their lives like this. And they then, our children, become our idol. In a sense, do whatever it takes to make sure your future to get into a good school is secure. And if it means putting your Christian walk aside, then so be it. And uh, that is signs of not following Christ. The second characteristic of the world is the desires of the eyes. These are sins of the mind or intellect. It is a, like a visual obsession. People who are addicted to pornography uh, fall into the lust of the eyes uh, and they, they give into it and it has taken root in their lives. But there are other ways too. One example is a person who is so uh, concerned about the way they look, their personal appearance, their haircut, their skin quality, their, the clothing they wear. And it becomes so important to them. And and so they then, if we buy into this, we are guilty of this form of worldliness, the lust of the eyes. Do we find ourselves reading magazines or watching programs about the rich and famous, in a sense, idolizing the way they live and fantasizing about it? We lust with our eyes when we obsess about things and desire to be like that. Whether it be our own or someone or something else that we just love to to look at and obsess over. We should be careful what we place our eyes on and the desires that it can rise up within us, the temptations for us to follow. The third characteristic we see is the of the world is the pride of life. Now in other words this just means a superior superiority complex. It is self-glorification, generally at the expense of other people. We put ourselves higher at their expense. And it is the feeling that somehow we're just better than others. Uh, We may even rationalize it as merely being a statement of fact. Well, this happens all the time. For us, even, it's a temptation for all of us because of our selfish, sinful inclination that we continue to struggle with and have victory over if we follow Christ. But, for example, how do we view those in the world who are poor? Do we view ourselves as better than them? Or those who have little education? Or those who are mentally or physically disabled? Or those who are in prison? When we look at these people, do we have a superiority complex? Do we see ourselves as better than them? I'm not talking about better, being in a better situation. I'm talking about personally being better than they are personally. 
that would be the pride of life. And most of the time, you and I will fall to this temptation of thinking ourselves as better than them if we're following after this uh, worldly characteristic. We set ourselves higher on a higher plane than they are. For example, did you hear about the clever salesman? Uh, he closed hundreds of sales with this one line. Let me show you something several of your neighbors said you couldn't afford. And that would rise the pride of life into somebody and they would purchase. Or another example of the pride of life is this young woman who asked to see her pastor to talk with him about a sin that she continued to struggle with. And so he met with her and when she saw him, she said, Pastor, I have become aware of this sin in my life which I cannot control. And every time I'm at church and I look around and I see all the other ladies in the church community and I realize that I am extremely way more beautiful than they are. And I, I just, I can't help but thinking about this this way. And I, what am I supposed to do with this sin? And the pastor just simply replied, Mary, Mary, don't worry, this is not a sin. It's just a huge mistake on your part popped her bubble. What are the things we boast about ourselves? Think about it. What are the things you boast about? Or maybe you don't verbalize that boast, but in your mind, you hang on to it. It's like, oh yeah, this is something about myself I'm really proud about. It can be pride in our accomplishments uh, or our influence with people or our acquaintances that we know. It can be pride in our ideas or our opinions that we have. Be pride in our stuff, like our car or our house or our job or, or the possessions we own. It can be pride in the school that we attended or the degrees we have. And we want those letters after our name so that everybody else knows that we achieved those things. Um, it, this all is a boastful pride of life. And it causes us to look down again on other people if they have not achieved those things. Or if they've achieved more, then it's like a competition, right? We may see ourselves as lower. We have this pecking order in our minds, and that is a symptom of the pride of life. It causes us to evaluate ourselves with the wrong standards. And this sort of thing, God utterly detests. And the Apostle John, our author of this letter, says that these things are not from the Father. They're not from him. They are instead things that are from the essence of this world system, things against the Lord God. Are you stumbling in your walk with Christ? Do you love the world more than you love Jesus? Whoever claims to live in him walks like Jesus. That's the truth of 1 John. When you evaluate your life, are you following after Jesus, would you say? Is there evidence of this in your obedience to his commands? Do you know the Lord Jesus? And you know this by the obedience you see in your life? Not that you never fail or sin or stumble in that sense, but that you can see that you have your heart and your life direction is in following after Jesus. If you are struggling in your walk with Jesus, then pray to him right now. Confess your sin as we saw last week. Confess it. Bring it out into the light. And even that act is evidence that you are following after Jesus. You're walking as Jesus did because you want to follow after him. You want to obey his commands. Share this struggle with whatever it is with a brother or sister in Christ appropriately. And Fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith. And he will guide you and enable you to continue and experience victory in your life over these struggles, these things that cause you to stumble. And he will make your path straight. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this truth and this assurance that if we just simply obey you, we will experience you more in our lives. We experience your power over sin. 
we will come to know you more personally as our Lord and Savior. But it takes that step of trust and faith in you as Lord, first and foremost. That we must trust that what you say is true. And so, Lord, we do that again. We commit ourselves to you as your followers. And we pray for those in our midst that are struggling, Lord, that we can be a community of grace and forgiveness when these struggles are shared, because we struggle as well. And we all follow you, Lord, in your grace, the tremendous grace of the Lord Christ. So, Lord, we pray that you would give us discernment about those who maybe we come in contact with that claim to be your followers and yet do not live walking as you walked. Lord, move in us. Help us to be bold witnesses for your truth by living and walking like Jesus. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Cornerstone, we'll once again see you in one week. God bless. Thanks, Pastor Jeff, for that word. Uh, let's respond with the song, I Will Follow.
Hi Cornerstone, happy Sunday. My name is Melody and I will be giving the announcements for this week. So let's all begin with the verse of the month, which is from Ephesians chapter 4, verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head, that is Christ. Our first announcement is about our missionary of the week, who is Nathan Liu. Nathan is serving with crew as a campus minister in New Jersey. Let's pray for him and his team to have many opportunities to make disciples of Jesus. Get involved in a life group. Sign up for a life group. The cycle started recently and goes through the second week of December. Commit to weekly fellowship. We are to walk in Christ with each other side by side. Sign up online at our website. If you are interested in being baptized at our next baptismal service, which will take place on Saturday, November 21st, or wish to join our church as a member, please notify Pastors Jeff or Paul. Baptism and membership classes start next Sunday, September 27th. Our mission conference for this year will be October 9th to the 11th. Dr. Mary Ho will be our speaker. The conference will be virtual this year. Sessions will be Friday at 8 p.m., Saturday at 10 a.m., Sunday a Q&A with Dr. Ho at 10 a.m., and then the last session at 11.15 a.m. Do you need prayer? Share your prayer requests through our website and our leadership will pray for them. Click on this image on our website to leave your request. So that's all the announcements that we have for this week. And now I will just close us in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this Sunday where we can worship together. I pray for your blessings on this week. And I just pray that you would give us opportunities where we can share Jesus and your love with the people in their daily lives, whether it would be with our neighbors, our coworkers, our friends. Um, Lord, and I just thank you for loving us and for providing for us. And I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen. All right, everyone, that's it for today. Um, I'll see you next time. Bye. Who can be, who can be me when I just don't understand?